All right, welcome back to part two, leaving where we just left off talking about third parties. Uh, certainly, we know the B example. What you should be familiar with is that third parties serve as a safety valve in some way, the check on the other two parties. They give an opportunity for other people who don't adhere to the two-party system to vote for somebody else. But of course, some of the reasons why third parties do not succeed, the winner takes all primaries um, or elections. You also, of course, have ballot access laws, wasted vote syndrome, and again, some people just feel a traditional aspect toward the two-party system where their family has always voted Democrat or their family has always voted Republican, so that they are going to do the same thing, not so much with third parties. But also be familiar with the major differences between Republicans and Democrats, which more or less reflect the differences between conservatives and liberals. Now, dealing with elections, uh, specifically the presidential election, their campaigns are much longer in the United States compared to Europe. In the United States, it can be really depending on when you toss your hat in the ring up to two years, whereas European elections can be as you know little as three months. Now, there are incumbent advantages, specifically for the House and Senate. You have the sophomore surge. You typically are going to attract more PAC money because an incumbent is already in office. You also have the franking privileges, amongst many others. Now, with the House, you have about a 90% chance of re-election, whereas the Senate, about 80% on average. Now, dealing with money, you have FECA, the Federal Election Campaign Act, which is going to establish the FEC setting rules for elections. Specifically, it's going to be about hard money. Now, hard money is the amount of money that you can directly uh, give to a specific candidate versus soft money is the amount of money that you would give to another organization who would then more or less campaign for that candidate. Definitely know the differences between soft and hard money. Now, there's going to be an attempt to curb soft money, known as the Bipartisan Campaign uh, Finance Reform Act, which is going to eliminate soft money. But this is actually going to inadvertently create 527s, which you can donate as much money to these organizations as long as these organizations do not directly endorse a candidate. And it even is going to regulate, you know, the, the if you can put out an ad 30 to 60 days before a primary election. Uh, but again, this inadvertently is going to create 527s. Now, Buckley v. Vallejo deals with election campaign finance, basically stating you can donate as much money as you want to your own campaign. campaign. You know, look at Ross Perot spending $60 million of his own money, or even Donald Trump spending millions of dollars on his own campaign. And that's, of course, uh, based on the First Amendment, that your uh, money that you donate is symbolic speech. And this is a similar ruling with respect to Citizens United slash SpeechNow.org, in which you're just going to have unrestricted amounts of money now going to politicians. And again, based on the First Amendment. Okay, now moving on with interest groups. Interest groups serve various purposes. Again, they're going to raise things onto the agenda. They are certainly a good example of a linkage institution, and they typically are most effective when they're representing a single particular interest. Remember that they are policy specialists at the end of the day versus political parties, which are policy generalists. Now, they're going to be using lobbyists. Um, there are some restrictions on lobbyists in terms of, of course, they can't accept money and gifts, or they cannot give money and gifts to politicians. And that was regulated under uh, 1996 um, Lobbying Reform Act. Uh, but lobbyists, of course, you know, the concept of the revolving door where you're going to be having former politicians now working for lobbying firms that are hired by interest groups. So be aware of that concept as well. The Iron Triangle, of course, that simplistic model where you have the congressional subcommittee, the bureaucratic agency, and then the interest group itself. It's very difficult to penetrate that iron triangle, according to political scientists who adhere to that. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. And one of the things that interest groups are going to do is provide support for specific subcommittees and politicians and bureaucratic agencies when it benefits their interest. Some of the major interest groups I would be aware of is now National Organization of Women, NRA, ACLU, AARP, dealing with older people, and the NAACP. Interest groups also utilize PACs to donate money. And of course, now with the advent of super PACs created by Citizens United, the FEC, uh, that has also now become more of an important tool. You don't really see 527s being used as much today because super PACs are a larger extension of 527s, 
uh, but nevertheless, be aware of that. Dealing with the media, many purposes here, dealing with goalkeeper, scorekeeper, watchdog, sometimes referred to as the fourth branch of government. And with the media, sometimes there are leaked proposals of a plan that a president's going to come out with. These are known as trial balloons to sort of gauge public reaction. And if the reaction's good, you basically are going to go with that proposal. And if not, you're not going to. Now, of course, there's going to be much more attention concentrated on the president compared to Congress. There are 535 members of the House and Senate combined versus just one president. So, of course, the president is going to garner more attention. Now, there's going to be the rise of the new media starting around the turn of the 21st century. You have people creating their own blogs. You now have the advent of Facebook, Twitter, etc., um, while at the same time you see newspaper circulation declining. Even media coverage on um, the television has declined as well. We've even seen the favorability of, of press toward the president over time decrease as well. A, a hallmark example would be with uh, FDR, where the press kept it secret that FDR could not stand, that he was wheelchair-bound. Today, if that were to happen to, you know, at, at the time President Obama or President Trump, uh, that would definitely be headline news. So you don't see that cozy relationship anymore. And again, that's going to change the very pivotal uh, turning point with the Vietnam War and the Watergate scandal. Dealing now with Unit 4 and the President, be aware of the enumerated powers of the President that are specified in Article 2, specifically speaking, Commander-in-Chief of the Army, right? You can negotiate treaties. You have the uh, use of veto power. These are specifically mentioned in the Constitution, which makes them enumerated powers. Now, growth over time since FDR um, of the power of the presidency, sometimes known as the imperial presidency, has significantly uh, increased. You have the use of executive agreements, non-binding, or I'm sorry, binding, uh, basically, I wouldn't call them treaties, but binding uh, documents overseas with countries um, during the length of that presidency that you do not need Senate ratification. Executive order, same thing, you're circumventing the checks and balances. Be aware of some of the checks that the president does on the judicial branch as well as the legislative branch as well as vice versa. 12th, 20th, 22nd, and 25th amendments all pertain to the presidency. Definitely be aware of that. With respect to wrongdoing, impeachment, charges are going to be brought up by the House and the Senate is going to hold the uh, trial with the Chief Justice presiding. Legislative powers, the veto is perhaps most important. Just the mere threat of a veto can derail legislation. And of course, the veto uh, has been utilized less over time just because the threat is enough. Paca veto, remember Congress cannot be in session and the president is not going to sign the bill, so the bill will die. Again, that only happens if Congress is not in session, if it is in recess. Sometimes the president will reluctantly sign a bill into law, but will put signing statements saying, I will sign this into law, but I disagree with the law because of A, B, and C. Judicial powers, perhaps uh, dealing with the appointment of justices to the Supreme Court or other federal courts. You would also say pardoning power of criminals uh, who have been charged with federal crimes. Informal powers, many hats of the president, morale builder, cheerleader in chief. Uh, people very much look to the president in many more ways than just the authorized powers that the constitution gives the president. Of course, there are some limits on the president. We know the War Powers Act, although it has not been used as a legislative veto, would actually most likely violate the separation of powers. And US v. Nixon limiting executive agreements, particularly when it's dealing with wrongdoing with respect to the Watergate scandal. But the president can be very influential with respect to the use of the bully pulpit in terms of persuading support for a specific plan or a specific piece on the agenda. Uh, the president can very much use the media, as we've seen with Teddy Roosevelt, for those of you who are your uh, history buffs. Now, moving on with Unit 4, with Congress, you have this term bicameralism, two houses, Note the major differences between the House and the Senate in terms of structure, passing a bill. I won't get into all of that. You, you should already know that. Um, again, knowing how a bill gets passed, a log rolling, pork, all that stuff is very, very important. And again, if it's a taxation bill, remember where it has to start. It has to start in the House. Anything dealing with revenue um, it has to start in the House. GAO, General Accounting Office, our government accounting office, is going to... Um, 
be responsible for auditing the government. You also have the CBO as well as the OMB. Be aware of those. You have caucuses where members of Congress are going to coalesce around a certain issue. In terms of the leadership, you have the uh, Speaker of the House, who's arguably the most powerful person in Congress. You have your whips trying to get the party votes in line, majority leaders, specifically in the Senate. And then you also have non-legislative duties of Congress. For example, if you're going to have oversight hearings, uh, that would be a good example of a non-legislative duty. Also, in terms of confirming appointments to the cabinets, as we see what's going on with Donald Trump's appointees, these are all non-legislative duties because they do not relate to legislation specifically. In terms of standing committees, be aware that these are going to spec uh, basically specialize in a certain topic area in which legislation will, could get passed. You have conference committee where you're going to reconcile the two bills, select or temporary joint, again, typically dealing with a rule, a house rule, it could even be something to wish a congressperson happy birthday. Seniority system, again, remember that's based on not how old you are or how long you've been in Congress, but how long you've been on that committee. And the longer you've been on it, most likely based on tradition, you will become the chairperson. Major standing committees, the House Ways and Means Rules Committee, I definitely be aware of that. Senate Foreign Relations, Appropriations, Judiciary, those are the prestigious committees. In terms of uh, districting in the House specifically, not the Senate because that's based on the state, you have Baker v. Carr where you have to basically, at the end of the day, have lines be contiguous. You also have to make sure that it adheres to the one man, one vote, which is what Baker v. Carr is going to establish. You can't have certain districts have more people than another district. Major powers of Congress, be aware of those. Again, with some of the major powers dealing, dealing with taxation, impeachment power, and also the Commerce Clause, Elastic Clause, Supremacy Clause, which have elevated the powers and strength of Congress. But of course, in recent times with party polarization and policy gridlock, um, you know, Congress, of course, is not always the most efficient. And let's finish up here with the bureaucracy. Of course, they are the action figures of government. They implement the policy that Congress passes. They are, in some ways, in, in the, have some independence because of their technical expertise. They also tend to be more loyal to the people in charge, whether it's the cabinet or independent executive agencies or independent regulatory agencies. And the growth at the federal level has been relatively stagnant versus lower um, at the state level, tends to be a little bit higher as a result of devolution. And since around the turn of the 20th century with the Pendleton uh, Civil Service Act, uh, you're going to be establishing merit reforms. So it's not so much based on nepotism. It's not based on patronage. It's more based on what you know instead of who you know. And here you see the four major types of bureaucracies here, or four components, if you will. Some of the major regulatory agencies, uh, SEC regulating the stock market, FTC business practices, FCC, FAA, the alphabet of government as we know. And then some pertinent Supreme Court cases, Humphrey's executor, the U.S., just basically stating that you can't just be fired uh, for political reasons versus Munn v. Illinois, which allows regulation of the government to actually exist. So it actually allows for regulatory agencies to be constitutional. Whereas uh, Iron Triangles, that's our simplistic type of um, setup with the interest group, subcommittee, and bureaucratic agency, um, others say it's more complicated than that. It's more convoluted, and there's more policy gridlock, and they say it's more of an iron network, or I'm sorry, issue network, I should say. Um, so it really expands beyond that simplistic view that an Iron Triangle has, and I do note that it's supposed to say issue network. Now, when we talk about pathologies of the bureaucracy, we're just talking about major criticisms. Perhaps the biggest criticism is red tape, the amount of policies uh, that you know you have to go through, a number of procedures to go through to get something done, that it can be slow. And certainly that can be uh, levied as a legitimate criticism. But ultimately, you know, note the checks on the bureaucracy that Congress has, such as the funding, uh, legislative oversight. President, of course, has the power of executive orders. So these are major checks. So I would be very familiar with a lot of the content that I've had here, but I would also consult the paperback book. I think that's a really good starting point as well, as well as your flashcards and all the questions that you've answered uh, in unit one through four. So of course, if you have any questions, please email me. Thank you and have a good night.